Um, I got some shout outs from Stony Brook, from Malaysia. That's a far way to come. I hope, uh, I hope your the time there is okay. Um, and uh, the Faroe Islands in Europe. Um, so we have a lot of interesting places represented. So thanks so much for joining. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about managing people. And I'm not gonna pretend that this has not been a challenging week for that work. Um, it's really, um, uh, it's really a, a difficult time and, and I've been working hard um, with the Ad Genies, helping them work, helping them have good morale, um, helping them feel good about what they're doing. Um, and maybe at the end of my talk, I'll spend a few minutes talking about what's up at Ad Gene right now so you can um, hear what, what we have going on. So um, uh, I wanna talk a little bit today. Um, I, I'll, I wanna be a disclaimer um, for this talk. This is an enormous topic. There is no way that um, I could cover all of people management in an hour. I have been managing people for some 30 years and you know I continue to learn and continue to do more um, development, um, things change, people change, your role changes. And so this is never a thing that you can stop learning. So I hope that this will just be the beginning of your learning on this topic. So, okay, so this is my career from a sort of manager perspective. Um, I actually saw that um, I, if you look at the number one or two, the first two people that I managed when I was in pharma, I think one of them signed up for this uh, for this presentation. So Michelle, if you're on, shout out to you. Um, I was really lucky. I had fantastic people reporting to me the first few, and it really gave me a chance to learn um, and to learn how to do uh, what I needed to do to work with a team and to manage a team. Um, you can see that my career is not, I haven't managed a lot of people all the time at any stage in my career. So managing people is not a sign of your, uh, your level or your prestige or even your leadership abilities. Um, it's just one of the many skills that's involved in a career. Um, now at Agine, uh, we have about 105 people. Um, and really, kind of the goal of my talk to tell you is, you know, wouldn't it be great if everybody worked somewhere that was fantastic? Um, and I think, you know, unfortunately, 100% of us do not have that experience. But don't you want to work somewhere that's fantastic? And if you're a manager, you can actually influence how your team operates and, and what it feels like to be in the workplace. So um, I, hope, uh, I hope you can find places to work that are as fun. I love working with the Ad Genies, um, even when we're all separate uh, in our own separate little spaces working, we have an incredible community and incredible culture. Um, so again, my disclaimer, this is a huge topic. Um, there's a lot of references and resources that you can use to follow up and maybe the next months are a good time to work on this. So, um, I'm going to talk about the goal of people management. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about working with scientists and technical people because we're special um, as far as management goes. And then we're going to talk about communication because communicating, good communication is really the key to pretty much everything, but especially to managing people and having good, good avenues of communication open and operating. Um, I make no distinction between managing in academia or managing outside of academia. Um, heads of labs, PIs, they are managers. And if they can do a good job at managing and supporting their team, their postdocs, their grad students, their technicians, then they will be more productive and the workplace will be better. Um, the same skills are involved. Um, those of you that have a great academic manager know what that feels like. And those of you that don't also know what that feels like. So, um, and it, it makes you less productive almost for sure. So we're gonna talk a lot about those things. Okay, so what's a good manager? I always like to say that being a good manager is not the same as not being bad. So this slide kind of jokingly refers to some of the really bad kind of managers you could have, the kind that, you know, never shows up for your meetings or doesn't talk to you and then swoops in like a seagull, poops on your project and then swoops away um, without really helping. Um, someone who, you know, has unreasonable work requests, like really, you're not working 24 seven, you should be, I am. Um, you know, these are all sort of obvious bad manager traits. But being a good manager has a little bit more to it. Uh, it's more about bringing in a mentoring aspect and a supporting aspect that really maximizes the talent of your team. So the goal um, that I am coming to realize is that um, 
all is that I really like this cartoon by Scott Adams because he says, I'm slowly becoming a convert to the principle that you can't motivate people to do things. You can only demotivate them. The primary job of the manager is not to empower, but to remove obstacles. So your job is to help people do a better job at their job. That's what a manager is. Um, and a good manager learns that when your team succeeds, you're succeeding. And it can get to the point where you do very little actual work. I mean, your, your work product though, comes from your team and the success of your team. So um, if you can reach that ideal, that is fantastic. So, so what is the goal really? A good manager helps make people happy so they're motivated to do well. And you have to include this as a factor in your decision and policy making. And I realize that not everyone can fully embrace the fact that being a manager, being happy is what's important, but it really is. But why is management hard? It would seem like happy, I can do that. The problem is that work needs to get done and it needs to get done well. And you can't always do things that make everyone happy. Yeah, it'd be great if we all worked one day a week or a few hours a day when we felt like it, but that's not gonna get the work done that we need to do. Um, and so you're balancing, you're balancing and looking for those tools that can help people be happy at the same time as making sure that work gets done well. So I'm gonna give you just a second. Think in your head, if you have a pen or a notebook, write down, what do you think makes people happy at work? What makes you happy at work? What would support you? What would really make you succeed? Do you think better than you are now? Or if it's working for you now, what are the things that um, would make work better? Make it feel more like not work. So I'm sure that you came up with a couple things and have in your mind at least one or two things that make you happy. When I do this workshop in person, we actually spend a little time fleshing this out. But there actually are data on what makes people happy. Um, I, there are many, many articles about this. And um, I'm just gonna share a few of the top line things that have been demonstrated to really make people happy. So the first one is a flexible work schedule. People are human beings. Sometimes they need to make their own time. Sometimes they don't feel well. Sometimes they can't work because of health or family or mental state. Sometimes they have a different schedule than you. Um, in general, giving people the most flexibility that they can in their jobs is, is better for the workplace. Um, I'm sure that those of you that are working from home now are living and breathing what it means to have a flexible work schedule. If you already had one in place, this is working way better for you now under very unusual work circumstances in the world. Um, and if you're interested, we can, you can ask at the end and I can tell you about how we manage this at Adgene. Um, but we have sort of radical flexibility. People want to be engaged in their work. Every single person in your organization and on your team wants to understand what they do and how it contributes to the whole um, at every level and in every role. And it's, it's the manager's job to, pr to provide that information and that kind of good feeling about what it is that people, um, that people are doing to contribute. People want to feel appreciated and valued. People feel this in different ways. Some people want to be thanked publicly. Some people want to be thanked privately. Um, and um, oftentimes this, this can come from people being involved in their own decision-making about their own role. So empowering people to make decisions about what they do on a day-to-day -day basis and delegating well. We're gonna talk more about delegating. Um, um, everybody needs to feel that. And if someone tells you, oh, you don't need to thank me, they're not telling you the truth. It just may mean that you're not thanking them in the right way. Someone may need a quiet note at their desk that says, hey, I saw what you did, great work, thank you. And someone may need to shout out to the whole company. It's part of knowing your team, deciding what the way that they can most feel appreciated and valued. People like to have a high degree of diversity and freedom built into their jobs. Now, we can't always have freedom. That's the work needs to get done part. But it's really important to not get people pigeonholed where they're not learning, they're not rotating, and they're not developing new skills. Um, that is a huge source of turnover in the workplace and losing people is expensive. You don't wanna lose them. And finally, they wanna like the people they work with. So if you have jerks, they're, even if they are productive, they're gonna affect the rest of your team in such a negative way that it's really worth considering altering their behavior or removing them from the team. Um, people like to work with good people and nice people. So the happiness sweet spot is different for everybody. Successful managers know their team well, and they know them well enough to support each person individually. This is one reason why one person cannot have more than somewhere between 
eight to 10 reports. That's about the most you can do because you really need to support all of those people. Um, I've looked a lot at no manager, you know, structures of, ma of, of managing an organization. And I don't really think it works because you're missing that crucial support and feedback from someone who cares about what you do and who's watching. So again, if we have time at the end, we can talk more about that in the questions. So scientists are soup, need the same thing as everybody else, but they're even a little bit more challenging because scientists are lifelong learners. And if someone is in a technical or a scientific role, knowledge intensive workers, and they're not developing new skills all the time, they will also move on. And it is your job as a manager to figure out ways to help them learn and grow um, and develop those new skills to keep them interested in the position. Okay, so as I mentioned, communication is really the heart of everything. And we'll, we're going, I'm gonna cover three topics in communication. One is seeking honest feedback. Um, and um, when I first got to Agene, uh, one of my employees was ac actually gave notice that day, the, the, the sort of operating officer of the organization. She was about to leave for a new job. And she came in my office and said, now that I'm leaving, I can tell you the truth about everything. And in fact, she told me a lot of great advice. And one of her interesting pieces of advice was, well, now that you're in charge, no one will ever tell you anything. And I really took that as a challenge, not as a given, like the glove has been thrown. I am going to work this because for me, if I don't have information, I cannot fix things. I can't apologize. I can't do learning. I really need to know what's going on and get honest feedback from people. And I have a lot of ways that I do that. And we'll talk about it in a few slides. You also have to give feedback when you're a manager. Um, and I'm not even going to call it negative feedback because hopefully you're in a mutual learning situation with everyone in your group and everyone is learning together. You, them, there's all kinds of corrective feedback that you can share with one another, but you have to. Actually, all employees I've ever worked with tell me honestly that they want to know what they're not doing properly so that they can fix it. And it's your job to help them figure out how to fix it as well. And that is another management challenge. And finally, you must delegate. You cannot do it all yourself. And you have to learn how to do that with respect and clarity so that it is successful for you and for the person that you delegate to. So first, seeking feedback. Um, as I mentioned, people won't naturally tell you things. So um, one of my, uh, one employee that I worked with for a while, a great colleague taught me manage by walking around. So I try not to be in my office except this month, I'm in my office all by myself all the time. But usually I try and get out of my office, go to different types of meetings, drop in on um, people with warning. You have to know who likes to be dropped in on um, and really talk with them informally and formally about what they're working on. One-on-one -on -one check ins are important. Um, trying to be an active listener. This is not my strength. I work at it all the time. I use anonymous polling. Um, I know which people in the company have their ear to the ground. That means they know more information and I can ask them about what's going on. In general, my rule about getting information, if someone shares useful information with me, I thank them and I make sure to get back to them and tell them what I did about it. Um, so I don't let, I try very hard not to let suggestions go into the wind and then no one knows. So actually we have a, not, a lot of anonymous polling at Agene, but I've post answers and actions to all of those things um, in my online internal blog, because I really feel like people need a response. You also need to give feedback and giving timely and useful feedback is really a key to being a good manager. Some of my rules are, um, I always make sure to also include positive feedback, but I don't believe in this like sandwich the, the feedback that's corrective. Some people just won't hear it. If you say, hey, you did a great job today. There was this thing that really went bad, but you're really great. They may not hear the thing that really went bad. You have to be really clear and, and, and um, straightforward about corrective feedback. Um, I don't let things fester. If something didn't go well, I try and approach it immediately. I don't pretend things didn't go well when they didn't. And if someone has worked through an issue, I don't try and bring that up again over and over years later. People grow, they develop. I try not to, make, I try not to bring those things back and back. The thing about giving feedback is it gets easier when you practice. So um, practice, practice. And if you can do informal mentoring or have a, 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 a intern or someone report to you and practice training them, teaching them, giving them feedback, um, it just gets easier. I also like to use sort of formulas for feedback, like what went well, what didn't go well, what should we do differently next time? And um, some people call that the plus delta, what was good, what should change? Um, and once people get used to that format, um, I think they do a better job of preparing for it. And in fact, they almost give themselves their own feedback. So it's a good way of um, 
it's a good way of, of uh, helping people grow and learn together. Another thing about feedback is you never give feedback about the person, you only give feedback about the thing, the behavior that needs to change or that you're talking about. Um, so um, it's pretty important that um, people in your team feel appreciated for themselves as they are bringing their whole self. Um, and, and that's also a really important issue in diversity that you can work with all different types of people. All of their styles are okay. We just have to figure out how we can work together to make your style jive with the work that needs to get done. Okay, I'm gonna skip this. Okay, so um, that's what I said. You really wanna focus on outcomes and not the person. Um, feedback should be focused on evidence, description, specifics. You should really write things down. Um, one of my um, really important rules of having a difficult conversation or a corrective conversation is that I really write down what I wanna say. Sometimes I even practice it with someone like an HR or a colleague that knows about the issue so that I really can choose the right words and careful words as best I can. I'm not always successful at this, it is a journey, um, nor will you be the first time probably, or maybe not the 10th time. I still struggle with um, doing this carefully myself. And, and in fact, I just spent a week in a workshop learning about how to have a conversation in a mutual learning style. And um, I really respect people who are good at this and, and try to learn from them. Um, okay. So um, delegating. Delegating is, is really a key to success in the workplace. People that are good delegators get much, much more done. Um, it's not only that you shouldn't micromanage, it also has to do with being open to communication, being open for questions. Um, because if you are not open for questions, then the person you've delegated to could go down on a path for the project that's completely in the wrong direction. Um, you, they have to be able to come to you and be comfortable asking any type of question. Um, so this is a whole skill in itself. There are whole books written about how to carefully delegate. And so um, if this is a skill that you would like to gain, I recommend that you do further study. Here's a little bit more about this. Um, one of the great things that we have now are these technical tools that make delegating much easier. Um, when I got to Agi and people really were just starting and now, of course, everyone is immersed in using shared Google Drive documents or however you share documents in your organization. Um, delegating a task is often done better if you have a shared document with agreed upon written goals, timelines, responsibilities, communication channels. Um, the more that you can capture that you're sharing and having clearly communicating to each other, the better the delegation task will be. Um, as a manager, you also have to focus on results. Yeah, I certainly have opinions about what fonts are the best ones to use. But if I went into every presentation for all of my reports and said, could we really stick to Calibri this week? Um, you know, they really don't need that type of support. Uh, you really want to focus on results and getting done. If the, if the task was communicated clearly and you get over the finish line, then that was a job done well. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about taking it to the next level. So you can be a good manager and do all the things that I talked about before, but to be a great manager, you need to grow your talent. Um, and that means you really need to be a bit of a mentor as well. It's easy to feel that the best way to help people is to tell them what to do, but sometimes the best thing to do is to ask them to figure out what to do. And um, disciplining yourself to ask questions before jumping in with answers, that's, those people make the best mentors and managers. Again, this is a, a skill that I struggle with and try and work on all the time. Um, so think of your, if you think of yourself as a mentor and let a little time evolve as, as you're developing a project together with someone in your group, um, they're gonna really appreciate that and feel much, much more accomplished. It's also your job to focus, as I mentioned, on the professional development of people in your team. What are they learning? How are they learning it? What are their opportunities to do something new? One of my favorite things to delegate is something that's easy for me, but a bit of a challenge for someone else. And so if it's easy for me, I'm not gonna learn anything from that task. Um, but um, if it's a little bit hard for the other person, I can mentor them through doing it and they can learn a lot. So looking for those opportunities to delegate, to unload um, an activity on purpose so that someone else can learn from it, um, that's a fantastic way to think of yourself while you're managing people. So a few points about effective communication. Um, um, so I realize that this is challenging now, but you should never do important communications, corrective or otherwise, via text or email. Um, there is no tone, 
in fact, if you have to write that email, write it and delete it. Do not send it. Um, now we have video conferencing. That's the best way if you can't do it in person. Um, people need to look you in the face. You need to be able to show them that you appreciate them, you care about them, and you're there to talk about um, how to make change together. Um, sending a punitive email is not acceptable and not effective. I mentioned before in delegating the importance of documenting. People hear different things all the time. Um, it's really easy to have running agendas and shared documents. I recommend that you use good note takers. I'm not a great note taker. Find someone who is um, and make sure that you're documenting um, and following up on things um, together in a mutual communication style. This is a benefit of technology these days and you should use it the most that you can. So people have very different communication styles and I'm sure you've heard about um, you know, the Myers-Briggs uh, style of, of learning and being and other and, the, and communication styles. Um, th these can be really helpful in understanding how people communicate on your team. Um, we had a team member at Agene once who said um, that they hoped that, um, they wished that everyone had, had their own playbook, their own like um, uh, directions for use, you know. And so it's really good with the people on your team to develop what your directions of use are. For example, I don't mind if my door is open, I don't mind if people come in my office. I don't need any pre-warning. I don't need them to slack me first and say I'm coming. I'm okay with a drop in and have a conversation if I'm available. And, and my contract is if I'm not available or can't put my mind to the question that I tell people, this isn't a good time, can you come back later? Um, some people really hate that. Some people want you to give them a day thinking about a topic before you come and talk about it. And so it's really good for you to learn about these different styles and possibilities. And so that's a great thing to study if you're moving into management. So people do have free will and um, you can be the best manager in the world. You can follow every one of the rules I've said. You can be an excellent mentor. You can do all the things that you can do. And still people are not all gonna respond the same way. Um, so let's say you say, I can't put your name forward for promotion unless I see you taking more initiative and paying more attention to detail. How can we work together to make this happen? A great mentoring and management statement. So employee number one, used the information, um, got better work quality, tried new approaches, was, had more initiative, and they got promoted. Fantastic, great news. You've, you've, that is the outcome that you wanna have. You want the people in your team to be developing. Another person um, didn't really understand what you meant by initiative, um, didn't really pay attention to detail, was a little bit aggressive, offended some important people, ended up getting fired. Um, you gave the same coaching perhaps, but people are people. They don't always take it the same way. And finally, someone on your team said, you know what, I don't wanna get promoted. I like what I'm doing. I don't want more responsibility. I'm happy with this. And they're doing a good job and they don't wanna get promoted. Um, and that's okay too. So all these, all the different outcomes that you can imagine from your coaching could happen. Of course, it's an ongoing journey, but um, you know, don't kick yourself. Not every employee works out. And a really important management tool, as I said, is sometimes people do not belong in the role they're in. In fact, you do them a favor by moving them on as best you can and being clear about what expectations are. And if they can't meet those expectations, that they should find another place to work. Um, that's not easy. That's not anyone's favorite part of the job. But to protect the rest of your team, it's a really important thing for you to do. So when you're transitioning to be a new boss, there are a lot of um, observations about this. I, I won't read this whole list. Um, again, this, this talk will be recorded. You'll be able to see it. But um, I, I think one of the ones I gave myself this permission and permission to all my new managers is you're probably going to micromanage in the beginning. And that's OK. Um, we're, you, know, you really want to get into the details and understand what's going on. When I first got to Agene, I went to all the meetings. Any meeting that was on the public calendar, I went to it. Every team, every time. Um, and after about three months, um, you know, someone came in my office and said, Joanne, you have to stop going to all the meetings. We don't need you at all the meetings. I was loving it. I was learning a huge amount of information. Agene is a pretty light meeting culture in general, so it wasn't more than I could handle. And I was learning so much. Well, that's fantastic, but it really was inhibiting the work of the groups, of course, to have me at every meeting asking questions and commenting. So um, I, I, I stopped right away. And now about once or twice a year, I, I sit in on different group meetings to just to be there to answer questions myself and to get myself on the page with those teams. And I find other ways of staying in touch. 
Another important thing is once you're management, you have to incorporate all the policies of management and work on them. You can't say they decided that we're going to do this. There is no they. You are them and, and you need to embrace that. And no one becomes the best manager on day one. It's really something that you can work for. You can research this. It's something you can study. Okay, so I get asked a lot when I give this talk to talk about what's a manager and what's a leader. This talk is really intended to be about managing people, not necessarily about leadership, but of course they are intertwined. Um, and so I've heard it said that when you're a leader, you work from the heart and as a manager, you work from the head. But I really think that being a good manager is a great start to becoming a leader because a lot of the things, a lot of the things that you need to do are the same. Um, and so for me, I really thought about and I've been asked to speak about leadership a lot. And actually all the skills I talk about are leadership skills, networking, communication, um, you know, career transitions, all these things are leadership skills. Um, but, but what makes leadership? And what I'm looking for, when I'm looking to identify someone who could be called a leader, it's really initiative. It's the people who um, are, have solved the problems in their head before they come to you to complain. And they say, not only do I have a problem, but I have an idea and a way to, so to solve it. Um, and that type of initiative can happen at any level in a community, in a, in a team. So that's why I'm saying, you know, managing means that people report to you, but leadership can happen anywhere. And as a manager, looking for the people in your team that are also leaders to develop them and allow them to express this can make your team incredibly more effective um, and certainly um, get more from those people. So you want to encourage that, not discourage it for sure. Um, here's another view. Um, managing versus leading. Um, in a way, this is the how to the why. Uh, managers figure out how and what needs to be done and leadership is figuring out why and, and um, you know, also leading through change. And, and that can be quite a challenge as well. Another view, um, same, same lines, but from the mind to the heart, as we said. So um, leadership has to deal with the culture and the feeling of, I mean, everyone has to deal with that, but it's their job to really create a culture and a, um, an atmosphere where everybody can give their utmost and feels happy doing it, or at least encouraged doing it. So one of my, um, one of my sort of uh, mentors here in the Boston area, uh, Susan Wyndham Bannister said, you don't become a leader, other people make you a leader. Um, and that's the case. You can't force yourself into a leadership role. It's other people looking to you for the kinds of things that leaders can provide from the heart in the culture, the initiative and the change and the management of change. So in your head for a second, think about a leader. And I'll give you just one second. Come to mind. Who's a leader that you know of, but someone that you know of? So did you think about this guy, perhaps? Um, so in this country, and actually scarily enough in the world, we think of white males as leaders. Um, and maybe you are open-minded enough that that's not who first came to mind because as you know, leaders can look like anything. Um, and so there's no single archetype of a leader. And what's super important, um, if you wanna be a leader or prefer to function more as a leader, um, or bring people in your team, and it, it's not the only way to be, by the way. Great managers are a huge important part of the workplace. Um, and, um, and I think um, it's really important to see that um, if you want to be this way, that you are open-minded about it. So this dovetails a little bit into my diversity work, which I'm not going to talk too much about today. But one of the most important things about being a manager is really creating an inclusive and diverse culture within your team. Um, and that's really super important because we need all, everybody involved in this venture and in every venture. And so it's really important that you learn to see the people for people and not for the things that the biases that we all bring um, to our observations. So how do you lead? You have to lead by promoting others. I said this, it's not about your work. It's about the work of the team. You want to guide people and bring them around. Um, you know, I like this quote from this, this quote from Nelson Mandela. He says a great leader is like a shepherd, stays behind the flock, letting the most nimble go out ahead, whereupon the others follow, not realizing that all along they're being directed from behind. A leader's job is to help lift others into the spotlight. You also have to lead by example. I don't know if any of you have kids, or, and if you do, they're probably bright. Um, 
do as I say, not as I do, never works with them. And it doesn't really work with other people. If you have values that you want to see happening at your organization, you have to live and breathe those values. You have to trust people if you want them to trust you. Um, if you want your team to bring their mistakes to light so that they're not hidden, then you have to be open about your mistakes and apologize. Just like yesterday, um, I went on, on Slack and told the company, I don't want to see people working beyond nine to five. Now that we're all working at home, it's a bit crazy. People don't know when they're not working or when they are working because they're always at home and on the same place. So um, I really, really want to try and myself practice this so people see it, um, that we limit our you know, inter-office communication from nine to five so that people can shut down and take some self-care during this really stressful time. And if you say that diversity is important, but you don't do anything about it, no one's going to believe you. So um, setting an example, as Albert Einstein says, is not the main means of influencing others. It's the only way. So you have to do what you're talking about. Finally, you have to lead with humanity. Um, you have to see each of your people as a person with unique needs, unique strengths, priorities, and contributions. They're the center of your organization. If you lead an organization, you know that the most expensive thing to do is replace people. When you lose them, you lose all the experience and that they bring. Um, so you have to be really inclusive and make this the cornerstone of your organization or you will lo lose people. Um, so I say your culture brand is everything. Don't be a jerk, don't foster jerks, and don't hire jerks because that will impact your entire culture. So how can you practice? Well, you can be the head of a group or a committee, take a leadership or managing role. Managing volunteers is managing. It's just managing without authority. So it's actually very hard managing. Start something new, that's showing initiative. Um, supervise someone um, less senior than you or mentor them in a formal program. Uh, manage a large project, that's a type of management is too if it involves other people. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can practice these skills aside from just reading about them um, and getting a position as a manager. Um, and it's great to practice and see what works for you and how to tweak your style so that you can be um, better at it. So um, that's the end of my slides on management. I'm going to talk a little bit about resources in a second, but I just wanted to say hi from Adjean first. Um, the Adjeanies are all home except about eight of them right now trying to get plasmids and materials, viral um, virus preps out to scientists first primarily who are studying coronavirus um, and we're also taking deposits of coronavirus related materials but really anyone who's available to receive eventually will be able to get their materials we hope so we have uh, an exemption that allows a few people to work under very careful conditions um, and um, I hope that you'll join us in our mission this is a great time to make a deposit to enter the data for a deposit if you're interested in contributing plasmids to the repository Adjean has all kinds of great materials available. Uh, hopefully you've all seen our website. It's a huge resource for molecular biologists, people working with viral vectors, AAV and lentivirus, all kinds of protocols. Um, we've distributed over a million and a quarter materials to scientists around the world. Usually we distribute 750 items a day. Right now we're doing about 750 items a week. So we're really sad, but we're doing our best to stay up and running for the scientists that are still able to work. Um, so hopefully that's our big packing room right there. Right now there is just one person in there. Um, hopefully we'll get up to speed really soon for all of you. Um, we have all kinds of reproducibility in, uh, practices, validation of everything. Um, that's one great thing about repositories. We collect all the data in one place. Um, we have a huge amount of information, as I mentioned on the website. We just upgraded our search to be really fantastic. Um, I hope you'll deposit. The main reason to deposit that top uh, picture is probably your freezer and that bottom picture is our freezer. So um, there's a lot of reasons. It's free to deposit and we support you the whole way. Um, like I said, while you're home, if you're home, not at the bench, this might be a good time to go back over your recent papers and get the data in for your plasmids so we can send you a deposit kit when the time comes. We have a huge amount of technical resources. A lot of the things that I talked about today are actually on our blog, um, spelled out in various blogs. We have career section, we have molecular biology resources, plasmids, genome engineering, fluorescent proteins, some fantastic free eBooks. Um, and we also answer questions on the phone and by email, technical questions and customer support all the time. Those teams are fully up and running. They're working from home on their soft phones. Um, so if you need that kind of help, it's, it is still a good time to call. 
So I also like to mention about careers in nonprofit. So, um, you know, if you're in a, if you are developing your career, if you're um, either in a, as already outside of academia and looking for what's next or in academia thinking about where you're going to go. Um, PhD, these are just some of the PhD roles at one of the cool nonprofits. One of the cool things about nonprofits is how diverse they are, how interesting the roles can be. Um, and so I urge you to look at those types of organizations when you're looking for um, jobs and positions. Uh, if you are job hunting, I might recommend the Seismic Job Site, S-C-I-S-M-I-C. -S -S you can see the logo on my slide. Um, this is a skill-based job matching platform for scientists developed by scientists. Um, full disclosure, I've been advising them for some years. I love working with them. I think they have something to what they're doing. And if you're looking for jobs, you should definitely check out the site. Don't forget to sign, download our career guide. A lot of the resources I talked about, um, things that I talked about today, there are resources in the, in the science career guide. And you can follow Adjean on social media in all different ways um, to get access to the link to this talk, which will be posted in the future, um, and to all the other resources that we and others in the community develop. Um, we have a lot of great guest blogs as well. Um, thanks again for joining me. I hope this wasn't too fast. It's really hard when I don't have an audience to pace myself well. Um, I'm happy to take questions on the chat. Um, and if there are no questions and you want to talk to me later, you can reach out to me. Um, I'm easy to find through Adjean or through social media.